Hello, welcome dorks. I'm Scott Solomon. I'm one of your co-hosts here with Kelly Wienersmith. You wanna say hi, Kelly? Hi, everybody. It's good to see everyone again. And I'm here with my daughter who's joining me because today is my birthday and she's keeping me company. And also uh, she likes Butterflies Are Gross, which is a book that was written by one of our presenters today. And so, uh, so yeah, Ada's gonna be joining us and I'm excited. We want to welcome everybody back. This is the second ever Dorks. So welcome for anybody that's joining us for the first time and welcome back to all the Dorks that were able to join us last time. Just a couple of housekeeping items here before we get started. Uh, we are going to have two great uh, presentations here in just a bit. Um, we'll have an opportunity for anybody that would like to uh, submit a question to either of our guests. You can do that through the Q&A button that should be at the bottom of your screen. So the chat won't work, but if you submit a question through the Q&A, Kelly and I are gonna be uh, monitoring those and we will do our best to get to as many of the questions that you submit as possible. Any other uh, housekeeping items I need to, to, to remember, Kelly? No, I don't. I, did you mention that, the, I think you mentioned the chat is disabled. So it's all yep. through the Q&A. Great. Exactly. So how's your drink going? Yeah, so I am uh, drinking the mocktail this week. So I am having a virgin Paloma. So uh, it's, let's see. It is very refreshing. So this is like a very light kind of citrusy drink. It's got grapefruit juice, lime juice, and um, salt. I felt very strange putting salt in a drink. And I thought like, wow, I've never done that before. Okay. Um, but it works. It's also got agave nectar. So, but then I re remembered like, well, margaritas, I guess have salt. And so it works. It's, it's, it's pretty nice. But how about you? What, what are you drinking? I, I am drinking the Picante Pigeon and Ada is drinking the mocktail from last week. So usually I don't drink tequila at three, but you know, it's my birthday. So we're going to go for it. And so Ada and I are going to try our drinks at the same time. Can you pick? Okay. If you don't want to try it, that's fine. So this is has jalapenos. Okay, so this has jalapenos and sugar and grapefruit juice and lime juice, uh, and I'm a little the jalapenos. I'm not quite sure about. So let's see. Ooh, oh, that's fun. Yeah, I really like it, and I'm not a huge tequila fan usually, but this is fantastic. I'm I'm enjoying it. I'm liking the pigeon tie-in with Rosemary's talk. Did you want to take a quick sip? All right, Ada's a little nervous. She doesn't drink juice often. Uh, okay, so this- at least, enough. If, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at least I would be less. Okay, well here, you can try it later. So- Is all it right, spicy? So then, should we have- it, It's a little spicy. It's not overwhelming. Uh, there's, it like leaves a little bit of a spicy aftertaste, but that's, that's pretty much it. Should we have Scott turn on his camera since Scott brought uh, different drinks for today? What are you drinking, other Scott? Other Scott. <laughs> hey, y'all. Uh, I brought uh, two beers from uh, the Texas region where I live. Uh, the first is Lone Star, which is labeled the National Beer of Texas right here on the side of the can. And then I have a, a craft brew from right here in Houston, Texas called Hopadillo IPA brewed by Carbock. And it's a nice kick in the teeth, hoppy beer, which I absolutely love in the evening, but we'll see how much I love it here at 220 in Texas. And I'll actually pop that open in honor of Kelly's birthday. So cheers, Kelly, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Kelly. Thank you, woo, thanks everyone. And what do you think of it, Scott? Is it, how is it at 2 p.m.? It's good, it's my go-to, so I love it. That's one of my favorite. I, I married too. a Texan. I, I married a Texan, so I've like had to try Lone Star, and I I can't say I love it. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I would say it's it's very situational for me. So ice cold while floating a river in the summer is perfect Lone Star weather. Um, I can two see or that. three o'clock in the midday in October. Who knows? Got it. Got it. <laughs> situation. So the 
talks today are about biodiversity, which I'm super excited about. So during the pandemic, I like tried to find something that I could do every day for like 10 or 15 minutes to sort of distract myself from all the stuff that's going on in the world that didn't have anything to do with work. And for the first year of the pandemic, every day I pulled out Seek and learned to identify something new on my property. And that was like a great way to sort of distract myself. Uh, but it really amazed me how many things don't belong here. Like I had no idea how many non-native plants surround me. Uh, and Scott, you, I don't know how much your class uses Seek, but you recently took your class on a biodiversity thing. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so one of the classes that I teach at Rice University is a lab class on bio, biological diversity, biodiversity. And so every year we uh, go out to the Big Thicket National Preserve in East Texas, which is this really cool region, just a little north and east of Houston. And each of the, the student groups are focused on a particular group of organisms. We had a tree group, we had a reptile and amphibian group, a fish group, and a bird and mammal group. And their job is to figure out how to inventory the species that are present there. So it was awesome. We spent the weekend out there camping and we saw tons of cool things. We you know, had camera traps for spotting mammals and uh, microphones to listen to bird calls. And they were in the creek seining for fish. And it, it was just, it was a lot of fun. And we saw some, some really awesome stuff. That sounds epic. Last night we were watching for bats. We were sitting near the light outside of our barn and we were trying to figure out how we could identify the bats. And so far we have no idea, but maybe we'll figure it out eventually. Yeah, they're Being super fast. hard to, to ID, right? They they do make like, there's like a way to, to record them where you can hear their the frequency of their calls, right? It's too high for human uh, ears to mostly hear, I think, right? But you can get like bat detectors that can figure out what kind of bats are around. Yeah, I, there's there's one that's like almost 200 bucks and you need an Android and I have an iPhone. And so I need to keep searching. The first solution I found was not quite gonna work, but if I can find something for the iPhone, then I will absolutely pick it up because Ada is pretty excited about bats. And so we're gonna encourage that as much as we can. That would be so cool to know what kinds of bats are out there. I bet there's more than than, than you would think, right? There's probably way more than, than what you can just observe with your own senses. Yeah, yeah, she had her guidebook and there were a bunch of species and we were like, yep, there's no way to narrow it down just by the general stuff that we've got. And so, but like, there are bats in our backyard and that's pretty cool. And if you stop and take a moment to appreciate them, they're even cooler. Uh, and maybe this is a good lead in to Rosemary's talk, which is about pigeons, which I feel like most of the time I just totally ignore, but every once in a while, I'll be like in a city and I'll stop for a moment and see a particularly pretty pigeon and I'll, I'll be like, oh, those are actually like rather beautiful birds that I mostly ignore. Uh, and so, so yeah, let's, let's introduce Rosemary. So I'm going to scroll down. So Rosemary Mosco is going to be giving us a talk today on the joys of pigeon, wa pigeon watching. She's the science writer and cartoonist behind Bird and Moon. And we are super excited to learn about pigeons uh, from you today, Rosemary. So share your screen and let's take it away. All right. Let's. And also, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm drinking water, <laughs> the preferred drink of the Water's pigeon. Water's good. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Very I'm theme excited to talk like about it. What's that? Very theme consistent. I like that. <laughs> let's say that. Yeah, let's say that. And I've eaten many grains today, which is also the preferred food of pigeons. So I'm being thematic. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So should I should I get rolling? Yeah, let's do this. Okay. All right. So hi everybody. I am Rosemary Mosco. I am a cartoonist and a science writer and a bird enthusiast and uh, mostly a pigeon enthusiast. And I am really excited to talk to you today about why you should take a second look at pigeons. So I'm gonna start with a question, which is when was the last time you really thought about pigeons? Because for most of us, pigeons are just sort of there. And if you do think about them, you might think those birds are annoying or they're boring or, oh gosh, they just pooped all over my car. 
But if you really take a close look at pigeons, you will realize that they are actually super astonishing. So here are three of my favorite things about pigeons that I'll talk about a little later. They ride the subway, they live in fancy expensive castles, and both male and female pigeons produce milk to feed their babies. And that's just kind of the tip of the cool pigeon iceberg. So let's take a closer look at pigeons um, and see what makes them so amazing. So first we're gonna look at the question, what exactly is a pigeon? So pigeons are members of the scientific family Columbidae, which comes from the Latin word for pigeon or dove. And this is a remarkable family full of all sorts of amazing pigeons, doves, and other birds. And I don't have much time to talk about this, but quick side note, there is absolutely no meaningful scientific difference between pigeons and doves. So the birds that poop on your car are the same birds that Noah released. Um, really, he, he hucked a pigeon out the side of the ark to try to find uh, dry land. So there are all sorts of amazing members of this family, Columbidae, and maybe the most famous member is the dodo bird. So really the dodo bird is just a, a large extinct member of that pigeon family. And I love this more modern reconstruction of the dodo, showing it being more kind of like a cool dinosaur than some of the, you know, more boring uh, reconstructions that we've seen in the past. And there are lots of really amazing living members of this family, like this bird, the Nicobar pigeon, which is my favorite living pigeon. It is so, just look at that incredible plumage, yellow toenails, pink feet, so, so, so cool. Um, this is also a bird that uh, tends to walk around on the ground and eat poop that is being pooped by other pigeon and dove species up in the trees. And so they'll poop out seeds that they can't digest and the Nicobar pigeon will uh, make short work of them. So really an amazing species. So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the city pigeon, which is known scientifically as Columbo livia, the word livia coming from a word meaning kind of a blue gray color. But it's also known by all sorts of different names like the rock pigeon or the rock dove or the common pigeon or the rat with wings or hey you get off my balcony and for simplicity's sake i'm going to be calling it the pigeon but just know that there are lots and lots of amazing pigeon species in that family so the wild ancestors of today's city pigeons lived in parts of europe africa and asia and this is kind of a rough map here but it kind of gives you an idea. They were in uh, North Africa, parts of Southern Europe. You'll see a little bit at the top of the UK there, um, parts of the Middle East, uh, bits of Western Asia. So that's roughly where they lived, but pigeons live all over the world now. So, so let's figure out why. So around 12,000 years ago, people in a part of the Middle East known as the Fertile Crescent started to build permanent settlements and farm the land. So you can see on the right, a little map of the sort of vaguely crescent shaped uh, territory I'm talking about. And most importantly, those farmers started to grow grain, which is what pigeons love to eat. And today still they'll eat, you know, our discarded hot dog buns. And that's really similar to what they used to do. So they used to hang around and they eat that grain that the people were growing and they'd sort of get closer and closer to people. And then something happened. So what happened is the people looked at those pigeons and they thought, hey, those could be really useful. So they tamed the pigeons, they built special homes for them and they shaped them by controlling their breeding which is to say that they domesticated them just like people domesticated the horse, the cow, the pig, the chicken, the cat, the dog, and the goat. Um, so the city pigeon is a domestic species. And you might be asking yourself, okay, why would you domesticate a pigeon? Because you look at a dog and you think, oh, that can be a, a guard animal. You know, or you look at a horse and you think I can ride that around town, but the pigeon so pigeons are actually secretly incredibly useful. And I like to think of them as this Swiss army knife of birds. If one of those tools on the Swiss army knife was just a huge pile of poop, because one of the biggest uses of pigeons is that they make a ton of poop and you can use that poop for all sorts of purposes. So poop poopuses, <laughs> sorry. So um, if you raise a ton of pigeons, um, you can scoop up their poop and spread it on your field and help fertilize it, particularly in places, you know, that may be more desert-like and don't have really fertile soil. 
Uh, and that poop also has saltpeter in it, which is an ingredient in gunpowder. And you can also use the poop for leather working. And that's only part of the usefulness of pigeons because people can also eat them, which may seem weird to some of you, but up until pretty recently, people in North America were eating lots and lots and lots of pigeons. And outside of North America, people eat a lot of pigeons too. And here's a picture of a pigeon pie. And that's really just the start. So pigeons can be pets, um, they can carry messages. So if you take a pigeon really far away from its home turf and tie a, a note to its leg and release it, it will fly home really quickly, really accurately um, and bring your message uh, with it. And similarly, they can compete in sort of races, which means you release a pigeon far away and you time how long it takes to, to get home. And we can also breed pigeons for appearance, for wacky behaviors, for interesting sounds, and so much more. Uh, and an example is on the right um, of the so much more, which is that before we had drones, you could take a little camera and attach it to a pigeon and fly it in the air and get kind of some rudimentary aerial photography. So pigeons became really, really important. And uh, the rich and powerful started to keep pigeons. And they kept pigeons to the point where in some places like uh, England and France, you weren't even allowed to keep pigeons if you were poor. So on the right is an example of a fancy pigeon house called a dovecote. And you can see these things really turned into like manor homes or castles. So pigeons really were sort of the Ferrari of birds. They were something that only rich people would have and they would sort of show them off. And pigeons were not only high class, but they were also decorated war heroes. So during World War I and World War II, and actually a lot of other battles previous to, uh, soldiers would carry pigeons into battle. And then when they needed to pass a message quickly back to base, they would release that pigeon with a message. And you can see on the bottom right, there's these little metal canisters that they would put their messages in that would be attached to the pigeon's leg and the pigeon would fly home. And so tons and tons of pigeons were released by, you know, soldiers, battalions that got stuck, you know, behind enemy lines or got in trouble. And the pigeons would rush home and call for rescue. And so pigeons were responsible for saving tons of soldiers' lives and getting these sort of comically large medals. There are just tons of war hero pigeons. And pigeons were considered so important to daily life of people in Europe and elsewhere that colonists wound up bringing them to North America in the early 1600s. They really could not imagine a life without pigeons. And as happens with a lot of domestic animals, some of these birds went feral. So think of like feral cats or feral dogs. And that is why they're here in North America. That's the only reason. And that's why there are pigeons all over the world outside of that particular zone is because they're stray domestic animals like a stray cat or a stray dog. So if pigeons were once so beloved, how did they go from being decorated war heroes to being, you know, the much maligned rats of the sky? Well, a couple of things happened, but uh, definitely the first thing that happened was that they became obsolete. They're kind of like fax machines now instead of Ferraris. So uh, whereas we used to use their poop for fertilizer and other things, commercial fertilizer, chemical fertilizer was developed. It's way cheaper and easier to make. And whereas people used to eat a lot of pigeons, at least in you know, North America, people started to eat chicken. And the thing about chickens is chickens can have a ton of babies at once and they don't need as much parental care and you can raise them in huge factories. And so people started to eat them instead of all the pigeon that they were eating. And then look at those war hero pigeons that were basically the internet of the past. Then the telegraph and radio and the internet supplanted those poor messenger pigeons. But then another thing happened, which is that we started to blame them for diseases. So in New York in the 1960s, some people came down with meningitis and health officials blamed the pigeons. They said the pigeons were creating this cloud of disease that was gonna spread you know, from city to city and all up and down the East Coast and all of these people were gonna get sick. And it wasn't true, it was not the pigeon's fault, um, but nobody knew that. And so people really started to hate those pigeons and see them as, as dirty and gross. So this hate for pigeons is a relatively new thing. And that's really because people have forgotten where pigeons came from. So let's take a quick look at some of the purebred ancestors of pigeons, which will really help us understand them because it really is a story of people and pigeons kind of interlocked. 
And some of these birds are just amazing. I wish I had an hour to show you all of these purebred pigeons, but uh, there are birds with spectacularly colored feathers like this Medina pigeon on the left that also kind of looks like a, like a cool little, you know, chunky um, chicken. And on the right, this glorious Nuremberg lark breed. And when you're looking at these, think about, you know, the purebred dogs and cats that you know. And there are birds with fancy foot feathers and eyes. So this beautifully named Saxon fairy swallow has a darker eye color, which has to do with a sort of change in pigmentation in the eyes. And also it has basically wings for feet. And what's going on here is that a gene that's expressed in the wings is being expressed in the legs. So it's literally growing wings on its feet. It can't fly with them, but just amazing. And here's another example. This is the Jacobin pigeon. This is a bird with such a fancy crest that it doesn't really have peripheral vision. So I drew a little arrow here to show you that white part in the middle, that's the bird's head. Uh, but it just has a spectacular feather boa crest, just amazing. So obviously some of these birds wouldn't survive, you know, the rigors of city life, but some of these traits have persisted. So because of this fancy ancestry, when you look at a flock of feral pigeons, you see all kinds of cool colors. So on the top left here is what the wild ancestors of pigeons used to look like, this kind of gray bird with these two dark lines on the wings. But on the bottom are a few examples of feral pigeons. So you've got red pigeons, gray pigeons, brown birds, white birds, birds with all different color eyes, all different color bills, just really, really cool, um, spectacular, spectacular animals. And it goes beyond just colors. Um, so there's this pigeon researcher named Elizabeth Carlin who used to catch pigeons in New York City and study them, put little bands on them. And she sent me these photos of birds that still have some of those characteristics from the fancy pigeons. So on the left, uh, a feral pigeon with a cool crest, and on the right, a feral pigeon with those cool feathery feet. So once you start looking at pigeon colors and cool traits, you're gonna start noticing something else really amazing, which is pigeon behaviors, which are so, so, so strange. So here are just a couple that you can notice. So let's talk about love. Pigeons are huge romantics. They tend to be pretty faithful and they stick together for life. And male pigeons will do that kind of bobbing and puffing up thing and cooing. And that's to impress their, their mates and also to you know, reinforce those bonds. Sometimes you'll see pigeons um, doing what looks like kissing, which is really cute, except what they're really doing is simulating puking in each other's mouths. Um, but you know, we don't know why we kiss either. So don't judge them too harshly. And what about nesting? So some bird species make spectacular nests like this weaver bird here. Look at this like glorious nest that it's woven with only its bill and its feet. Just amazing grass structure, just absolutely incredible. And then take a look at, you know, a pigeon nest. So uh, pigeons don't make very spectacular nests. Sometimes they just throw down a few twigs and then plunk an egg on there. But again, don't judge them too harshly because one, we domesticated them. And so they really just wanna live in structures that we've built, but also um, they nest on flat surfaces. So in the wild, they would nest in holes in caves. So they were not used to having to worry about making a nest that would keep an egg from falling you know, out of a tree. So they're really not too worried about making really fancy nests, but it's still pretty funny. Okay, milk. So both male and female pigeons make milk and they make it in an area of sort of their esophagus called the, the crop. And this milk is amazing. It has a lot of characteristics that are similar to human breast milk. So it's stimulated by a hormone called prolactin, which also stimulates it in, in humans. Um, it has lots of proteins and fats in it. It also helps boost a young pigeon's immune system. And it's one of the reasons why it's hard to raise pigeons all mass is because they really need a little bit of that milk when they're starting out, which I think is just amazing. Okay, riding the subway. So pigeons around the world will ride the subway. And uh, a lot of people wonder, well, are they using it to get around? And the answer is probably not. So when a pigeon goes into a subway car, it thinks, oh, a warm box full of crumbs and people, all my favorite things. And then when it's done with the crumbs and the people, it will go out and it will fly home. Um, so they're not really using it to navigate around the city on purpose. And I think we can solve this by making teeny, teeny, tiny subway maps, which we could stick at just pigeon eye level so that they could use that to sort of successfully navigate the, the subway. 
So I think pigeons are really interesting to watch, but if I haven't convinced you, then maybe this friend can convince you because pigeons are a really cool way to see other birds in the city uh, that might be a little harder to see. So when you're walking, watching a flock of pigeons, if you see them burst into the sky, all mass is a big terrified flock. Keep your eyes out for falcons like the peregrine falcon or hawks like a red-tailed hawk or excipiters, which are hockey birds, sort of like the Cooper's hawk. And you will see the most amazing birds if you watch pigeons. And I've seen just some really, really cool encounters. So you can use them to bird watch too. So there's a lot to enjoy about pigeons and lately people are really falling in love with them more and more. And I think there are a lot of reasons for this, but one of them is that we all just love underdogs and pigeons are really the underdogs of a lot of the city world. And sometimes their struggles are just super relatable, like this bird from the wildlife comedy photo awards that is, you know, hoping to enjoy a nice summery day and getting hit full in the face with, you know, the oncoming fall. Um, I think we can all relate, especially right now. So watching pigeons is really easy and it connects us with nature, history and humanity and all kinds of, you know, really interesting disciplines. And that's really what pigeons are able to give us or at least that's one of the things that they can give us. So thank you so much. I have a new book about pigeons coming out on Tuesday called A Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching, Getting to Know the World's Most Misunderstood Bird. And when we're all done, please um, help me with as many questions as you would like. So thank you so much. That, that was wonderful. I learned a ton of about pigeons and Ada and I laughed out loud a couple times. Yay! You, um, you know, where I'm going to ask a question. So I, I've been working on uh, coming up with trivia questions. And while I've been coming up with trivia questions, it's amazing how many things I've come across that I thought were true, but weren't true. And your talk made me think of uh, this thing that I've heard in the past that now I'm wondering if it's true or not. And it's that at some point we brought all of the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare over because uh, we wanted to have them in the U.S. And so I want to know, one, is that true? And two, were pigeons part of that? Oh, yeah. Okay. So from what I know, that was definitely at least partly true. Um, but it wasn't just that. There were also a lot of societies that wanted to turn North America into a place with the gentility of Europe. So I'm pretty sure that's why house sparrows were brought over is they were like, well, house sparrow is a civilized bird that we should see because they don't really have any uses. So there was a lot of kind of silly colonial shenanigans going on. But no, pigeons were absolutely brought over because people could not imagine civilization without them. Like they were so important that it was sort of like the idea of not bringing a pigeon was like not bringing, you know, your clothes or something. They were that important. So that's definitely true of like the starling, which, you know, you can't eat. But yeah, no, pigeons were like essential technology. Got it. That was so good. That was absolutely fascinating. I wrote down a ton of notes and have a bunch of questions as well. Um, we also have some questions that um, some other folks have submitted. One of them um, is from Steve, and he's asking about the range map that you showed, uh, pointing out that it looks like the, the pigeon's wild ancestor was uh, kind of a, a disjunct range, right? It was not a continuous range, and wondering if that is like uh, actually uh, accurate or is it just that we don't have information about what might have been happening in the kind of intermediate area? Yeah, that map honestly is just to give you a really rough idea because pigeons were domesticated at some point between 12,000 and 5,000 years ago. And at that point we're getting, we're bumping up against the edge of recorded writing, you know? So we can't pin it down. And I think it would be really hard to pin down their previous range too. Um, given that, you know, our feral birds, the moment we started domesticating them, they started interbreeding and we started spreading them around. All kinds of stuff started happening. At some point we interbred them with another species, which had speckledy wings, which is why some of them have speckledy wings. Like there's so much bizarre stuff that happened, but it's just so long ago that we can't pin it all down with accuracy. So yeah, no, I, I'm curious about that map too, but I think it would be really hard to reconstruct an accurate map of exactly when without any kind of human interference. I mean, Neanderthals were eating them. <laughs> so we don't know exactly, you know, what was going on back then. 
Scott, other Scott, do you want to unmute to ask Rosemary your question? Sure, yes. Um, I was really interested to learn some of the additional wacky behaviors or especially the sounds that were selected for in pigeons. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, there are a few breeds that are meant to sound, you know, they, they all sort of coo, but the cooing can be really weird. So there's one called the Thai laugher that makes kind of, I mean, I can't mimic it, but it makes a kind of a laughing cooing sound. <laughs> um, I know that there are some birds that were developed so that their cooing sounds sort of like a call to prayer, like they were developed by mm. Muslim pigeon breeders. So there's just a whole bunch of different ones that will make kind of variations on the coo and they sound pretty different. I don't know that any of those traits survived in feral populations. I think they all pretty much coo, but, but yeah, just sort of a weirder cooing. Very cool, thanks. Uh, Ada has a comment and then I'm gonna take one of the questions from the Q&A thing. So what is your uh, comment, Ada? I didn't know that pigeons did all that stuff. Cool, thank you. thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And thanks for enjoying my butterfly book too. I hope you found this talk just as, just as gross. There certainly is much poop. We, we've read the butterfly book yeah. a lot. Yeah, oh, it's awesome. I don't know what it is, but still. <laughs> well, we'll find it. We'll find. We actually have three copies because Zach ordered it, I ordered it, and then I forgot I ordered it, so I ordered it again. And so oh, anyway, we'll we'll find one of those copies. I support soon. this. Oh, I fully nice. support this. Yeah, I, I. We'll probably also have two copies of the pigeon book because I'll order it, and I'm sure Zach's already ordered it, and we don't communicate very well. Uh, so, Chris Cruzling. Uh, asks, okay, so not meningitis, but what diseases can people get from pigeons and or their droppings? That is such a good question. So uh, it's complicated. I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I've read some review papers that have looked at diseases and pathogens that pigeons can give people. And there's a small number um, that they can but unless you're just really, really kind of like handling a lot of pigeon excrement without protection, or you're like really, really up close to them, there's not a lot that they can give you. Um, if you're immunocompromised, you should be really careful around pigeons. But even if you know you, there's a sick pigeon and you wanna rescue it, for the most part, there's not a lot that they can give to you because, um, birds and humans are so, you know so evolutionarily distinct that the stuff that gets them doesn't really get us and they're not even like major car carriers of bird flu for example so i go into all of that in my book and like i wish i could give you a more nuanced answer um but it would take a long time but you're you're pretty safe around pigeons there's a few things that they can give you there's a few sort of parasites too that you could potentially get but for the most part most of those reports are either incredibly rare or they've been misattributed to some something else so they're really not a big problem you can't get rabies for example so you're you're pretty safe just the pigeons in the park are not going to harm you for sure maybe you don't eat them Good to yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I'll try to avoid that. So here in Texas, dove hunting is actually a, a pretty popular, um, you know, pastime. Like, you know, that's something that that people have been doing for a long time and still do. Um, so I guess that's sort of like, you know, people still still eating uh, a, a type of, of pigeon or dove, since you said those are um, essentially the same the same thing. Um, I don't think I've ever tried it though. Have Have you? That's a good question. So when they're hunting, I think they're probably hunting morning doves, which are one of the most hunted birds in North America. People just shoot them a whole lot. I don't know if they taste any different. For the most part, when you eat pigeon, what you're eating um, is young pigeon called squab that is just about to leave the nest. And after they leave the nest, they're considered not as tasty. Um, I haven't eaten them. I'm definitely curious about it. I don't think I could at this point after doing all of that reading. Um, but yeah, people definitely eat morning doves. And in fact, um, the passenger pigeon, so there's, this is this tragic thing is that the passenger pigeon was this really, really important food for a lot of indigenous people, you know, particularly the Seneca, but other people too. And so colonial folks came in, wiped out the passenger pigeon, you know, ate it and brought in their own pigeons and were like, actually, we're going to eat this particular pigeon. So it's a sort of tragic story of 
of replacement, but, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, pigeons are on the menu for a lot of, a lot of people, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't had the honor of eating, a, eating a pigeon. So I have two comments. First of all, uh, a friend of mine who knows that I'm trying to learn Russian, which is really complicated, uh, says that the way that you say pigeons and dove in Russian is galub, just mm -hmm. so you know. And I'm sure that I butchered the pronunciation, but thanks to Hannah for that. And uh, there's another comment mm -hmm. in the Q&A saying uh, they also sometimes attend the Met Gala, so pigeons not only are on the subway, but maybe you've seen, have you seen that they, they went to the Met? No, but I mean, some of those pigeon breeds look like some of the outfits. I feel like there should be an entirely pigeon ex in inspired Met Gala because when I see that one with the huge feathery boa, I'm just like, I want to wear that outfit. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It, it, yeah. And so then my, my question is, so you mentioned G, the G.I. Joe pigeon. And it seems like people form really close, like person, some people form very close personal relationships with pigeons. And so pigeons sort of have personalities and their stories get told. Do you have a favorite pigeon or a favorite pigeon story? Gosh, um, I once found uh, a pigeon in uh, a neighborhood I lived in a, a few apartments ago that just looked like it didn't belong. It was this pure white bird, very, very chunky. It just didn't have the right shape of a pigeon. And so I Googled it and it's it was a king pigeon, which is a utility breed, which basically means you eat them. So it's this like big muscly looking pigeon. And so it had escaped. And when those birds escape um, and they haven't had a few generations to kind of, you know, get selected by the environment, they're not super, super good at surviving. So I was like, I'm gonna rescue this bird. So I took maybe two weeks trying to coax this bird to get closer and closer. And it was not happening. It was not happening. All the neighbors thought I was, you know, losing my mind because I just kept coming over and like trying to coax this pigeon over. And finally, this one neighbor said, oh, I have an idea. And she grabbed a recycling bin and she just walked up to the pigeon and held it over. And the pigeon sort of burst into the air and kind of gently bonked against the recycling bin. She scooped it up and we took it to the Humane Society and they were able to, you know, find an owner for this pigeon. So the, that was the time I spent two weeks rescuing a large meat pigeon from my, my neighborhood. And when I brought it to the Humane Society, they looked at it and they said, oh, great, another one. And they put it in this giant cage they had of all these pigeons. So go adopt a pigeon as a pet because there are so many of them and you can buy them little pants so they won't poop in your house. <laughs> and I love it when the solutions are easy. Mm -hmm. Could I ask another question? I'm dying to know more about the whole milk situation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, right, so like I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I'm thinking like about how these things are related, how these body parts are related. So the pigeon milk comes from the crop, which is part of its digestive tract. Human mammal milk comes from a different location in the body, different organs. Is there any relationship between them or are we looking at like true independent evolution of milk in different organisms? I have no idea. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Please look into this for me and let me know because <laughs> I really want to know. It's not identical. It's kind of um, cheesy, I think. Okay. And uh, there are other birds that produce it too, but it is interesting because both males and females produce it. So I'm not really sure. I mean, you know, evolution can have amazing coincidences, but this is quite the coincidence. So I, yeah, I, I don't really know, but I want to Super know. cool fact. Thank you so it's much so for that. so cool. Yeah. Can't I've never, I've also never drunk that. I, I don't want to try it. <laughs> that's going to be next, next time, or that's going to be our mocktail. Be pigeon. It's gonna have pigeon milk. That's your your week for the mocktail then. <laughs> Since we're talking about evolution, I have to throw in my favorite um, or one of my favorite pigeon facts, which is that Charles Darwin kept pigeons and was really into them and used them as one of the like you know primary examples in the origin of species of how breeding can change all these different characteristics and and that was his big analogy right so um so yeah i i that's you know always been something i thought was a, a cool fact about darwin keeping it i think he had a custom made pigeon coop and and had a bunch of different varieties 
Yeah, he was he was in love with pigeons. So if you read Origin, it's so full of of pigeons. And, you know, you can't help but realize he just loves pigeons so much. So what happened was he realized that he needed to kind of do some experiments on his own. And so pigeon keeping was all the rage at the time. And he was like, oh, well, I guess I'll raise some pigeons. But he sort of wasn't super enthusiastic about it. And then the more he got into it, the more he just became completely obsessed with the pigeons. So he was, what he figured out was that all of the pigeon breeds come from one breed because it, or one species, because at that point it had been thousands of years and people didn't know. Um, so he figured out that they all come from Columba Livia and that helped him, helped inform his understanding of change over time from, you know, one species and to many different breeds at least. But There's this letter that he wrote to, I think, Lyell, where he's like, come visit and I will show you my pigeons, which is the greatest gift that any human can give a friend or something like I'm totally paraphrasing. But he was basically like, there is nothing better than coming over and seeing someone's pigeons. Like, you have to come see my pigeons. (laughs) So he was totally in love. He was so in love with them. And am I correct that a, the term for someone who, who keeps pigeons is a fancier, a pigeon fancier? Yeah. And as someone whose sister was really into cats and had a subscription to cat fancy, I, like, I think that's kind of an old school term, but yeah, you're a pigeon fancier and they're called fancy pigeons. I love that. Yeah. Uh, and if I can be selfish and ask ask the last question and ask one more question. Uh, so uh, what I'm wondering is, so so pigeons are used to like transfer these messages. Is that just because we happen to already be pretty good at keeping pigeons as like pets or is it because they are in particular really good at go like better than other birds at going from place to place reliably or was it just sort of like a fluke and other birds could do this too? We just happen to already have pigeons. I, I think it's mostly that they have an incredible navigation skill. And then to a certain extent, we also bred them um, to be better and better at it too. Although we tried breeding them. So the, the downfall of pigeon, of pigeon messaging is that you have to take it away from its nest and then release it and it can only go one way. So we tried breeding birds that could go two ways and it, it didn't really work out super well. But pigeons have this incredible inborn navigation ability that we don't, it's fascinating. I thought I was going to look this up and and it would be easy to understand, but we don't really know why we know that there's probably a magnetic component. There's an olfactory component. There's like, they're noticing things. They're seeing polarized light. Like we don't know, you know, what exactly is going on there. It's probably a huge combo of things. Different pigeons use different navigation senses, but they naturally have this amazing ability to find their way home. And then we selected certain breeds to be sort of better. And we, you know, picked the finest racing pigeons and bred that too. Um, but yeah, so they're really pretty special in their ability to, to find their way. Lots of other birds can find their way too, but that was, that was a big reason why we started to breed them more and more. And they were used up until pretty recently. There was a, there were some police in India who were using them to get over some rugged territory until like a couple of decades ago, which I think is pretty cool so maybe that will make a comeback you know we'll see cool did did was there a comment you wanted to make no but i do need to say that i do not like mine no but then i did okay ada didn't like her drink initially and then she decided that the aftertaste was good oh Um, okay well that's a good metaphor for liking pigeons hopefully people will go from not liking them to then realizing hey (laughs) In retrospect, these are delicious. Yeah, but I like that. They grow on you. Yeah, it, yeah. It covers. Yes, she was. She was taking notes and drawing while you were giving your your talk. So oh, beautiful. She'll remember this for a while. Beautiful. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, that's gorgeous. Oh, that's beautiful. Nice job. I can definitely say that I will be very uh, much more like attuned the next time I'm I'm seeing pigeons outside like now I'm, I'm really actually looking forward to just to, to going out and looking for pigeons and trying to to see if I can spot some of the things that you that you just talked about so Yay. thank you that was that was fantastic that was fascinating awesome yeah awesome. that was awesome thank you and hilarious <laughs> yeah absolutely I had to check a couple of times that my mic was muted because I was laughing out loud so <laughs> <laughs> Yay. I'm already thinking how I can use the term 
poopuses into uh, something in my lectures or maybe just to my children. You're, you're welcome <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> That, that's probably when Ada laughed the loudest was when, when we were talking about food. <laughs> awesome. Nice, nice. Well, Scott, I'm excited to hear from, from you about other backyard creatures too. Yeah, so let me let me uh, introduce our, our next um, presenter, uh, Dr. Scott Egan, who is uh, a colleague of ours, um, a colleague of, of me and Kelly in um, the Department of Biosciences at Rice University. Um, and um, one of the, the things that uh, Scott pointed out here is uh, that he has a, an interesting way of connecting with the topic that we just heard from Rosemary, <laughs> because he, uh, as he described it, has a strong homing pigeon gene, because this is something that's very rare for academics. Uh, but Scott now lives in the same place where he grew up. He married a girl that he's known since fifth grade. His kids play soccer and baseball in the same fields where he played as a kid and their grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins cheer them on. This is like unheard of in academia because we end up moving around so much for our, for our education and ultimately for our jobs. Uh, but Scott's one of the, the lucky few who has managed to uh, find a way to, to get back home much like a homing Pigeon. So uh, Scott is going to be talking to us today about some of the really interesting work that he and his lab do on backyard discoveries of biodiversity. So take it away, Scott. Cool. Thanks, uh, Scott and Kelly. And, and thank you, Rosemary, for such a great first talk. Let me share my screen. Hopefully you can't see the number of tabs I have open on my computer. All right. So hopefully you can see uh, some beautiful uh, small wasps and uh, the title of my talk today will be Backyard Discoveries of Biodiversity. And before I get started, I wanna tell you if I use the term we or I, it's really just the royal we. Uh, I run a research lab at Rice University where I have uh, PhD students, postdocs, I collaborate with uh, uh, scientists, both early career and, 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 and more senior folks from all across the world. Uh, so, so what I'll show you today, I will share the stories with you, but they involve a complicated matrix of, of contributions from different people. And, and, and that even goes to the lab at Rice that I run, including some of the undergraduates that I both teach in the class, but that also come into our lab and participate in some of the work. So, um, we call it team-based science, and I, I thank them for all their contributions. So just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Scott Egan, as, as uh, Scott introduced me to say. Uh, I'm an associate professor at Rice University, and I describe myself in two ways. Uh, one, as an evolutionary biologist. And in my life as an evolutionary biologist, I study um, adaptations and the evolution of new species of insects. And so... I love to show this little cartoon on the left of um, a drawing by Darwin, where he was first trying to conceptualize and think about the relationships of organisms across the planet as he was coming up with his uh, beautiful and wonderful uh, idea. He even wrote, I think, in the top corner, which I find very inspiring. And then uh, I also like to describe myself as a scientific naturalist. And that's going to kind of fill in some of the, uh, the topics I'll discuss today. So what is a scientific naturalist? Well, it was clearly described by um, uh, Doug Fatuma, who is a National Academy member here in the United States and a professor at SUNY Stony Brook. And he wrote a very nice essay in the journal American Naturalist many years ago uh, titled, Where For and Whither the Naturalist? And he described a, nat a scientific naturalist as this. I think of a scientific naturalist as a person with a deep and broad familiarity with one or more groups of organisms or ecological communities who can draw on his or her knowledge of systematics, distribution, life histories, behavior, perhaps physiology and morphology 
to inspire ideas, to evaluate hypotheses, to intelligently design research with an awareness of an organism's special peculiarities. And so that's the sort of approach we take to uh, natural history, which is the kind of quantitative and systematic observation of the natural world around us. And so I wanna set the stage for a, a system, a study system that our lab uh, applies this approach. And it's just like a food web that we all learned about in fifth grade uh, with some sort of plant, some sort of herbivore and some sort of predators. And so the plant in our story is a group of oak trees called live oaks. And here's a wonderful uh, live oak that's uh, just south of Houston growing in a cow field. And just like most plants and trees, uh, they have accumulated a group of herbivores, things that like to eat it. And our lab studies a very unique and peculiar group of herbivores called gall wasps. They are called gall wasps because these wasps induce the tree to grow a home for its babies. So mom wasp comes and lays her egg onto some part of the tree, releases a little bit of venom, and the combination of that phenomenon and the little hatchling baby wasp and maybe some proteins in its salivary glands induces the tree to grow a structure around that feeding larvae. And so I've given you a sample picture of some of the galls that grow on the live oaks right here in Houston, Texas, where I live and work. Uh, you can have very tiny galls, a millimeter in size on some of the male flowers called catkins. You can have these beautiful P-shaped brown galls on the undersides of leaves, these beautiful, much larger uh, peach colored galls on the um, uh, buds and around some of the stems. Some that are quite fuzzy on the underside of leaves, some again, very tiny rice grain sized galls and some more cryptic galls, things that are just within the stem. And really the only way we can find them is we see the exit holes from previous emergent animals. And then some that are a little more obnoxious also galling the same stem. So all of these things you see on the top, all of those structures are completely made of plant material, but they are induced by the gall wasp that lives inside of it. So basically you have insects that can, can control the stem cells of the plant to grow the wasp a home. It's a really spectacular phenomenon. And to just continue up the food web, we have our host plant, we have our herbivore, and these herbivores accumulate a species rich community of predators. Predatory wasps in these systems we call parasitoids. And so you can see this diverse array of species that we can have come out of any single gall collected on one of our oak trees. Uh, the ones I'm showing you here are all what we'll call kind of traditional parasitoids. So they lay their eggs somewhere in the gall and their baby goes and attacks the gall wasp baby. Some of these are hyperparasitoids. So they just don't really care who's inside, whether it's the gall wasp or some other predatory parasitoid, they just lay their eggs in and devour who's inside. We also have other cool members of what I'll now call the natural enemy community. Uh, down on the bottom right, I have highlighted these two individuals, uh, females and males of a lineage called Synergis or Synergis. These guys are actually closely related to the gall wasp, but they're cheaters. They cheat the system. They have lost over evolutionary time the ability to induce galls themselves. So they go and co-opt the gall created by one of their sister lineages. They kill the individual inside, usually indirectly, but they can live inside that gall, sometimes even manipulating gall growth in different ways. So these are cheaters, but also kind of in a way that kills the gall former. And then there are other insects outside of the wasps that I'm showing you so far. There can be beetles or moths, which as grubs or caterpillars will bore through the plant material of the gall and in fact specialize on that material. So the collective here we call the natural enemy community. So we have plants, we have herbivores, and we have this predator group. So you might ask like, well, how do we do this? 
How do you rear out galls? You must need a lot of expensive equipment. And the answer is no. Uh, so for the most part, quite often, I'll collect these galls on different oak trees, throw them in a Ziploc bag, thumbtack them to a wall in my lab, and just watch what comes out. They're pretty amenable to kind of bringing out of nature and into your own home or office. Here I'm showing you uh, what I might call the Cadillac of gall rearing. Uh, most of this you can buy at a local grocery store, but it starts off on the bottom with just a simple mason jar. And then you have an upside down funnel with some holes cut in covered with mesh so the insect and gulls can breathe. And on the top, uh, I've stuck a vial with a little cotton swab. So uh, insects are naturally like to fly up. So when the insects emerge from all the gulls we collect, they just fly up into that container and we can collect them, observe them, or maybe freeze them to look at their DNA in the future. So when we do that, we find this amazing diversity of insects. So just to kind of describe that more quantitatively, here's that one single species on the live oaks, these P-shaped galls on the underside of leaves uh, induced by a, a wasp in the genus Bellinocnema. And we find this amazing diversity of insects that crawl out somewhere on the order of 30 or more different species of tiny insects crawl out of these galls. So you have the gall wasp that makes it, and they usually have about a 1% chance of survival because mortality due to predation is about 99% in some years. And we've repeated this across multiple galls on the same species of oak. So here is one of those more cryptic galls on the left, uh, which is in the genus Bassettia, makes these uh, little tiny crypts on the insides of stems that are really hard to find, but it's not hot. It's not hard to, do we need help with the tie? I might have to help my son with a tie real quick. Do we need help with a tie? Okay, come in here real quick. No problem. So, my so son's, Scott is, oh, no, go ahead, Scott. Uh, my son is going to uh, something tonight, so I need to help him with the time. I'll be back in one minute. Yes, take your time. So uh, Scott is actually talking about a, a, an experiment that he and I worked on together. And so while Scott is, is gone and can't be embarrassed by the things that I'm saying about him, uh, one of the things that I love about working with Scott is he makes these just like amazing observations that I think would get past most people, but he just spends so much time staring at these oaks and sort of collecting data and thinking about what happens that he makes all of these incredible observations. And anyway, all right, I will, I will back off. I hope your son has fun at his dance. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, he's, he's headed out. So, um, okay, so I'm back. We've done this for um, another golf former on the same oak. And again, found this just amazing diversity of tiny insects that crawl out of it. And what's really cool about this is that, um, well, first, let me, let me take a step back. So when we get all this diversity of insects, how do we determine what species we've found? So there's two methods that we've used and that many scientists across the planet use. The first on the left is a morphological key, and it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. Um, if this insect has body covered in dense hairs, go to step 17. If it does not, go to step 18, right? And you follow this kind of choose your adventure and eventually it leads you to a potential answer. We also complement the morphological work with DNA barcoding, where we sequence a very specific section of the DNA and we use those A, T, Gs and Cs in the pattern they exhibit kind of like you would use it a barcode at a grocery store. And we compare that to a, um, a database of, of, of sequences available to us and we find the closest match. And so we use both morphology and DNA to kind of uh, determine what we found. And what's really cool with both the Bassettia uh, gall community and the Bellinocnema gall community is that about one in four or 25% of these things tend to be unknown to science uh, and, and potentially uh, new species. And, and so the way that works with a morphological key is you follow the little pass and it leads you to an answer, uh, but that answer might be, 
oh, you found species X. And of course, species X is on maple trees in Alaska. But in fact, you're sitting in the middle of Texas looking at an oak tree. So there never tends to be a perfect fit when you follow those keys. Same thing with the DNA. You might find a close match. It's the same species. You usually get a really tight match, like a 100% match or 99% match. But when you find something's a little different, maybe you've 90% match too, meaning 10% of the ATGs and Cs are a little bit different in that barcoding region, which suggests maybe you're close, but not quite there yet. So that leads us, leads us to this kind of one in four number so far. So to just give you an example of that in this bottom left, one member of the community is in the uh, genus um, Allerogus. So we wrote a paper describing the community and uh, there we just had to leave it Allerogus species because we didn't actually know what species it is. If you dig into the literature on this one species, it appears that there's one species from the US. It's described from a location right in the University of Maryland, right by in DC, and then a, a locality over in Arizona. So that already kind of looks a little weird. But south of the Rio Grande River uh, in Mexico and Central America, there's something like tens or hundreds of species of Allerogus. Um, so uh, again, kind of a mismatch, such diversity um, just across the river doesn't seem to make sense. Luckily, we were contacted by some scientists at UNAM in Mexico City who actually work on this group of wasps and they read our paper and they said, that's weird. How could you find Allerogus crawling out of galls on live oaks in Texas? And so Ernesto Samaca, who is a uh, uh, finishing PhD student in the lab of Alejandro Zaldivar um, have started to work with us on really figuring out who these individuals are. And uh, first and foremost, we sent them off some of these samples that we reared from Bassetia and from uh, Belenachnema, and they immediately, quite quickly, looked at the morphology, uh, sequenced a little bit more of their DNA, and were able to give us some feedback that these were very likely new and undescribed species because they did not match the only species that have been described in the US in the past. So they sent me on a field trip, both to go to the Smithsonian in Washington DC to check out their entomology collection, which is where the type specimen of Allerogus existed for the United States. And that was also where uh, the University of Maryland was. So I like, walked around campus and started crawling up trees, picking gulls and getting stopped by the campus police. Uh, to see if I could find some living examples of this historical thing that was described from the United States. So long story short, we collaborated, we used um, uh, genetics and morphology, and we're able to basically quadruple uh, the number of species described from the US in this lineage Allerogus, and also add some interesting complexities because in, in the US, they seem to be doing things differently than maybe what they're doing in the rest of their range. So we're expanding kind of the species interactions, not just the species numbers for Allerogus uh, across the Americas. Okay, so with that little story, it kind of leads to like, could there be other undiscovered species out there hiding in plain sight? Some of those Allerogus were reared from uh, the campus of Texas State University in, in San Marcos, Texas or Rice University in Houston, Texas, which is the fourth largest city in the United States. So thinking about the oak trees and the whole different community of gallers that each has this predatory community, there might be things we're missing. And then if you expand that one extra level of, of complexity, the lineage of live oaks, the host plants, uh, I've told you about some things on Quercus virginiana right now, but in fact, there's seven species surrounding the Gulf of Mexico, a species that makes it to Eastern Mexico all the way down into Costa Rica, a species on the Western coast of Cuba, and then this wonderfully interesting isolated population on the Southern tip of Baja. And many of these are right within the city limits of large cities. So Austin and San Antonio and Dallas and Houston and New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Biloxi and Mobile and Gainesville and Miami uh, are all within the range of where we're making these discoveries. So these really can be made within the city limits of, of large cities. And each one of them has gall wasps and parasitoids and other predators. All right, so now I wanna tell you uh, about another interaction 
Uh, this one, I'll, this little vignette I'll call Tales from the Crypt, and we'll focus in on the Bassettia galler that induces these very cryptic galls within the stems on live oaks. And in fact, each of the inter, in individual um, uh, compartments we actually call crypts. And if you actually cut into the skull to get a little visual of what's going on, you can actually see the wasp growing within these crypts. And out of it should emerge this beautiful cynipid, which we call Bassettia uh, pallida. And um, I, on a recent, semi-recent uh, family vacation, uh, happened to be walking through some sand dunes in the panhandle of Florida, uh, looking at some of the live oaks that grow there, a species called Quercus geminata or the sand live oak. And uh, my daughter and I were just looking at the birds and looking at the bugs jumping in and out of the, the brush. And we noticed uh, that this one oak tree was heavily damaged by Bassettia. And we saw it because we saw all of these little tiny uh, black holes along the stems. And this is normally not a very common gall to see, and I've never seen it in such high densities. I found it in this one spot in these sand dunes. So my daughter and I, of course, uh, shoved them in the Ziploc bags we had in our pockets and labeled them and at some point brought them back to my lab at Rice after our family vacation was finished. But at some point in that process, we took a little closer look and on the left, you can see this beautiful opening where a Bassettia has crawled out of the crypt. But in a couple of the other holes, we saw the Cynipid looking back out at us. And that was quite peculiar. I mean, every once in a while, I'll see a gall wasp get stuck, but this was quite systematic and common and, and very unusual. And so, interestingly, I had just seen a research talk by one of our hosts, Kelly Wienersmith, who uh, uh, studies how parasites manipulate the behavior of their hosts. And it just kind of dawned on me, maybe there's something going on, never reported that to my knowledge in Cynipid was, that that could be going on here. So I just did a couple dissections when I got back to the lab. And in about 10 of those 11 dissections, if you look on the bottom left, I found two individual wasps. I found uh, kind of the remnants of Bassettia. And then in the back here, you can see this little cream colored larvae, which eventually formed into a pupae you see on the top right of some second species, which was very interesting. And always in association with this head looking back out at me. So I put these things in a cup, really didn't think about it. I got busy, had to teach, had to take my kid to baseball. Um, but a couple months later, um, I peeked into my little Ziploc bags and I noticed that some of those heads now had a hole in them. Um, and in fact, it wasn't just some accidental hole. Many of the heads suddenly had holes and they appeared rough around the edges, almost as if they'd been chewed. And then I looked very carefully at the bottom of those Ziploc bags and I saw an amazingly beautiful iridescent wasp, which I'd never seen before. It has the beautiful purples and greens, white parts of its legs with these little black socks, little uh, tiny hairs on its antennae, it's just a gorgeous animal. So just like before, when we rear out members of any uh, gall former community, we did the morphology trick. Uh, which we sent some up to my collaborator, Andrew Forbes, who's really good with that. And then we did some of the DNA sequencing as well to kind of match it up with what is known. And it didn't appear that anything was matching. But we did at least get it to genus. And it led to this genus called Euderus, which is in the Eulophidae, and they are known to attack, attack Owas. So pretty cool. So. At some point right around this time, I was supposed to have a meeting with Kelly on a completely different topic. And I ended up attacking her with all of this information and telling her I didn't know what was going on, but I thought it was really cool and potentially linked to the work that she did. So we all ended up collaborating and exploring this topic and thinking about emergence holes and why some of these got stuck and some had these holes chewed through their face. So the first thing Kelly thought to do was measure the size of these emergence holes. 
and she did that. And um, wh what we noticed was that it tended to be that when we call these, these ones are infected, <laughs> Uh, they tend to make slightly smaller emergence holes versus the normal emergence hole is a little bit larger. In fact, it was about 25% smaller when they were infected. So that was an interesting observation associated with this head plugging phenomenon. And so that led us to start linking uh, the behavior, this phenomenon in Bassettia, the gall wasp getting its head stuck in the hole and the Euderis wasp that seemed to be hiding in that same crypt and eating its way through and out of the head of Bassettia. So we did an experiment. Uh, and we had these two hypotheses. You know, one was kind of the abiotic hypothesis about how maybe Euderus was manipulating the behavior of Bassettia. One was like the abiotic hypothesis where maybe the head is important for like the abiotic conditions. You got to keep the gall really gross and wet. And so the head plugging was very specific to keeping the developing second wasp nice and humid as it turned into an adult. The second was that, well, maybe it's like a host plant thing and um, the, the secondary wasp doesn't even know how to chew its way out of the tree. And so it needs the gall wasp to chew its hole out. Then it just stops there and just waits for the other insect to eat through. So we did an experiment where we um, kind of manipulated things. We poked some holes in, we covered some of these head uh, plugs with, with uh, fresh bark. And we did that a couple hundred times and we just waited to see what crawled out. And what we noticed was really, really clear. Um, you know, we had some controls to our experiment and if we poked in the holes, they all tended to survive pretty well. But if we covered it with bark, it did not survive very well, which suggested that the little manipulative Euderus wasp seem to require Bassettia to crawl through and eat through the wood to actually build a hole so that the manipulating wasp can get out. So we put all of this natural history and these experiments together and we're able to describe a new species. And we were able to actually kind of understand how this kind of interaction between these two critters work. So this wonderful cartoon by um, the French cartoonist Boulet who helped with this by illustrating this phenomenon kind of walks us through this. So you have our little gall wasp here on the top. It lays its egg. She lays its egg as she normally does, which induces this little crypt gall within the stems and eventually it should crawl out. But here in D, eventually sometimes those crypt gallers are found by this second wasp, Euderus. And she lays her eggs, her babies in there somehow, manipulates the behavior of the cynipid to burrow through and get stuck. There's its poor little head. And then the Euderus wasp burrows through the body, eats a hole through its face and emerges to complete its life cycle. And Kelly and Andrew and our collaborators got to name this species and we named it after the Egyptian god Set. And in those stories, it describes um, the god Set as being like, being able to manipulate animals, being like the god of chaos, and a specific story where Set killed his brother Osiris and cut him up into a crypt. And so all of those stories match so well with the natural history of this organism that um, we named it Euderus Set. So we want to, of course, know how widespread this phenomenon was. Hey, Scott, am I doing okay on time or do I need to finish up? Yeah, well, and so um, I think we want to make sure we, we have enough time for questions. So I sure. already have a bunch of questions. I think Kelly does too. We've had a few submitted. So I, I, I know you've got more that you could go on and talk about, but I may. No, 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 I was we waiting can... for this. Yep, yeah, I got my time. Yeah, just too, so. to make sure we get, because I, I think there's a lot of, um, of great questions already that have been submitted. So why don't we- um... Stop here. Yeah, why don't we why don't yep. we uh, give folks a chance to ask a few questions? Yep, totally. Cool. Um, I will um, start off first of all just by saying I, I love I love this story. This is such um, a, a you know great example of how a careful a careful eye, a trained eye, and also just a careful you know observer can notice things that are are 
literally in, in your backyard. And I think you maybe you were going to say this at some point, but if I'm not mistaken, didn't you also find the same species like literally in your backyard or front yard or somewhere near your home? Yes. Yeah, so I have live oaks growing in my front yard. There are live oaks growing out the front door of the biology building at Rice. And there are live oaks growing in the parking lot of my favorite Tex-Mex restaurant that I've been eating at since I was a kid. And in all three of those locations, you can find this phenomenon that's been going on for millennia that no one has ever seen. I love that. It's just, it's just remarkable. Uh, wow. And, and very Halloween appropriate. So well-timed there. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So one question I have before if, uh, we jump into some of the submitted questions. Okay. So this is happening in oak trees. You've documented all of these really interesting you know, wasps that are that are attacking these oaks or or laying their eggs in oaks, and then other things are are you know laying their eggs in 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 those. Are oak trees unusual? Is this something we we would expect to find in you know pecan trees and elm trees and the other trees we have around, or is there something special about oak trees? Yeah, great question. So, gall formation has actually evolved independently at least six or more times within the insects. So there are gall forming flies, gall forming thrips, gall forming beetles. And um, across gall forming insects, they attack a whole host of plants. So you can see them on many willows and maples, and, uh, just a ton. However, the cynipid wasps, this group that I've been talking about today, do tend to specialize on oaks. So for whatever reason, their histories are intertwined and they are tied. Um, there are a couple rare examples of cynipids that call other things like roses, which is super cool, but about 80% or more of all described species of cynipids um, induce galls on oaks. And we explore this one little lineage called the live oaks, which is seven species. Um, in the US, there's like 90 species of oaks. If you go across the Rio Grande in Mexico, there's like 190 species of oaks and there are more described every day. So the potential diversity multipliers there of unknown biodiversity is just staggering. I will never have enough time to do it. I love that, I love that. So um, so Chris has a question in the, uh, in the Q&A here about, are we, is it like, should we be thinking of these gall wasps as herbivores? Are they actually consuming the plant tissue or are they just growing there and then they go out and they eat something else? Yeah, they are a true herbivore, uh, just a very peculiar version of them. So if you do a dissection just straight through the center of a gall, uh, what you'll find is it's structurally complex. It will have a, an outer kind of protective layer. It can have like plant hairs that are overexpressed. It can be really, really hard. And then a, almost like a quirky material, and then you'll get to the center and it's a true nutritive tissue. Uh, so plants are full of all sorts of defensive chemicals and the cyanipid will manipulate even the chemicals. So the chemicals will be concentrated on the outside. And in the center, it's just this wonderful nutritive tissue to the point that um, we don't know a ton about what's going on at this very small scale, but they appear to almost be lapping up almost a gooey liquid of plant material that they themselves induce the plant to create. Um, I just finished a completely separate study with my collaborator, uh, Ellen Martinson at the University of New Mexico. And we did like transcriptome sequencing and she was able to get transcriptomes of the inner part of the gall, the outer part of the gall and the leaf. And the differences between the leaf and the rest of the gall was like 10,000 different genes were either upregulated, downregulated, turned on and off. It's an amazing, manipulation of a host. So transcriptomes being a way of looking at what genes are doing, right? Yep. The genes are being turned on and they're making a, a product, they're making yep. a protein that goes off and it does something. And you're able to yep. look at not just the sequence of the DNA, but what the DNA is actually doing for the organism, right? That's right, that's right. Very cool. Do you um, want to ask a question to Rosemary or I will jump in? Oh yeah, do you mind if I ask a, a quick one? Go for it, um, that's great. Great, yeah, oh, this is so interesting. Um, I, I love the Egyptian mythology angle, that's so cool. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention, I did take a quick peek and pigeons making milk is an example of convergent evolution. So it's sort of like your galls, which is again, just so weird that 
you know, it, evolution rolls the dice the same way multiple times. Um, I also, this is going to sound like a really, really silly question, but so are they kind of making a GMO food product out of this? Like, can we make our own delicious plant material? Like that is a great question. Um, I mean, in one way, they are genetically modifying their host. And so with some other gall former systems and some other manipulation systems, just in general, um, you can sample the host and you can find the manipulator's DNA or micro RNAs like well into the tissues of the other organisms. So they do appear to be truly changing, manipulating uh, the individuals. Um, so that's a, a really good question. And, and, and yes, they are, they are genetically modified. Wow. Thanks. So I loved your talk. And one of the things I love about your research in general is that when I was an undergrad and I was sitting in ecology class and they were telling me that like, oh, you could be a scientist. I remember thinking, well, gosh, I mean, this textbook is like filled with stuff. What is there mm -hmm. left to find out? But the like tiny little details, like the last brick in the wall of some boring theory that like people started figuring out 50 years ago. But like you find new, awesome natural history observations that are like really exciting, like all the time. And anyway, that, that makes me very exciting, excited. But Ainsley has a question, which is unrelated to what I just said. And so when well, could you I intercept just about... for one? I'm sorry, could I tell you one yeah. thing, Kelly? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, one thing to say, I am not a trained entomologist, right? Um, if, if you focus, you know, your attention on some, um, tangible system, right? It's not like I focus on the world, right? If I focus on this one thing, uh, I think anyone can really make these kinds of discoveries. There's nothing magic about what I do. Um, I, I, I kind of have other lives in my research life that I they also have to work really hard on. Um, but it just so happens that by studying this one little thing and being able to see the things that are maybe unknown and then you know ask others that might be specialists like my collaborators at UNAM, like I, I don't, didn't know about Allerogus wasps, but they were the specialists in them and they were able to say, hey, those look new. And I was like, yeah, and they seem to be really different and weird here. And we combined to be able to do that. So by linking in with folks, it's, yeah, I think um, anyone could do this, so. Sorry and you're me. also willing to, to spend time looking for them on your family vacation though, right? That's an important <laughs> point. Yeah, this is a long-standing issue in my family. Anywhere we walk, if you are trained in birds or bugs, it's a disaster. You can't walk five feet without having to stop. I, so we I can have totally, rules. I can totally relate. I think you know, but what this is like, this is like a perfect dork theme. I think you know, whatever you're a dork about, like you're going to be a dork about it all the time. You can't just turn it off, right? So that's just this just goes goes with the territory. Yep. Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. <laughs> So, um, so Ainsley, when you were uh, going through Belek Naknima and you were, which I probably said incorrectly, but I said it fast. So, you know, it's hard to, hard to say that's the trick. And so, uh, so anyway, when you had the beetle pop up, she said, yes, finally some beetles. Tell us more about the beetles and what they are doing in there. And she said, and furthermore, how on earth do you tell which unspeakably tiny Calcidoid made the gall versus which are predators slash parasitoids slash hyperparasitoids. Sure, right. So to start off, the gall is induced by the cynipid. So we know that much, but then as we build into that enemy community, which includes predators, these parasitoids, hyperparasitoids, beetles, moths, and of, it gets a little more complicated. The beetle is part of this group or guild we call inquilines. And inquilines are specializing on the gall tissue itself. They don't actually, um, to my knowledge, actually target the gall former inside, but they do specialize on the gall material. Um, and so they eat the outsides and usually indirectly um, kill the gall former or a parasite inside. But yeah, it's a really hard question to really make the individual connections of who is a parasitoid, who is a hyperparasitoid. Usually we just, have a little black box, which is the gall, and somebody comes out of it. And it's usually the gall former. And then sometimes we get all these predators, but we, we don't actually know sometimes um, 
the specific individual interactions. I'm really excited about this technology called micro CT scanning. Um, folks are starting to apply this to biological questions as it's been used very broadly in, in the medical fields, but you can scan the insides and inner workings of galls now and see individual species or individual larvae moving around. And so I'm hoping that will shed light in fact, uh, the Bassettia euderis example, we don't know exactly where euderis is to manipulate Bassettia. And so I'm hoping to get some of those in a CT scanner with a new colleague that just joined us here at Rice. So that's maybe one way we'll be able to start teasing apart the inner workings. That sounds awesome. And then maybe you can figure out what the beetles are doing too. You can tell Ainsley and Ainsley will be happy. I think they're just eating gall tissue on the outsides of the gall. They just specialize on that nutritive tissue that's, again, sort of devoid of the plant defensive chemicals that the, the gall wasps has pushed to the very outsides. And that connects a little bit to a question that Aleda had, which is, can galls be reused? And, and so I think the question may be about like, are other insects or other organisms using the galls once the gall wasps or whatever species crawls out of it comes out, does anything else use those galls? You know, when you started that question, I thought of my friend who uh, lives in, in Colorado and she actually makes jewelry from galls. <laughs> so you're saying reused. I was like, yeah, they can be used for art. Uh, but yes, um, many of the gallers will, um, their, their, their gall will stay on the tree for sometimes months or even years. And so those galls can be used by ants that like to nest in very small compartments. Um, if we rear out old galls that are years old, we will still get aphids, ants, uh, these beautiful tiny things called pseudoscorpions, which have the front pinchers and then just kind of a little uh, uh, funny fat abdomen in the back. Um, all sorts of creatures use these as kind of a secondary colonizer of that habitat. So yeah, sometimes we refer to Galwas as ecosystem engineers, uh, where they engineer this thing that is colonized by all of these different community members, and you wouldn't find them on the tree if uh, the Galwas weren't there. So you, you mentioned briefly there about them being used as art, which is actually connected to a question that Hannah had about whether there are other uses by, you know, for basically can they be useful for people in other yeah. ways? And, and if I remember correctly, um, weren't galls once used for making ink? Yes, iron gall ink is what the Declaration of Independence was written in. And I wanna say even the Magna Carta. Uh, so it was used very commonly uh, in the uh, 16, 1700s uh, for ink uh, because of the tannin content, one of these defensive chemicals in plants that interacts with the, uh, the, uh, the iron to make the, the beautiful ink that they can write in. And I, I wish I knew more about it. I just know that it's used and has been historically used. Um, there's been another use for galls. Um, one of the galls I showed was a beautiful peach colored gall. It's quite large on the oaks. Um, in addition to the gall wasp inducing the gall to grow its home, it also induces the tree to emit a sugary substance, a nectar that attracts ants and other bees and wasps that come settle on it. And so in the Smithsonian, there's this little sample of honey uh, taken at the very end of the growing season. And some of the beekeepers in California where this was taken claimed that the gall formers who are emitting the sugary substance were critical to the health of the hives at the very end of the season once most flowering plants were gone. And it made a slightly different type of honey uh, that the bees would consume and bring back to the hive. Um, and so, so, so maybe it's really important for, it's an undiscovered interaction and, and something important to bees worldwide, um, which are always being threatened. Uh, the the woman who asked that question is also the woman who told us the Russian spelling, spelling of pigeons. And I was chatting with her on the phone the other day and she was excited about links between cow, how cancer is kind of like these galls. Hmm. Uh, and I was kind of excited because I feel like I often say like, oh, these galls are kind of like tumors because you get these cells that are sort of growing like crazy. And I was like, but are they really like tumors? And she studies it and she says, yes. And so I thought that was pretty exciting. 
Um, but anyway, cool. it, Aaron uh, wants to know, are the galls harmful to the live oaks? How much energy do the trees have to expend to grow them? And then I'm gonna build on his question and ask, are all galls equally harmful or hmm. not to the oaks? Yeah. So it's a hard question to ask for gigantic trees and very, very tiny wasps. Uh, in the extreme, when the gall wasps get to very high levels, outbreak levels on a single individual, um, it, it causes structural damage to the trees. So you can have so much gall formation that it weights the tree down, that they actually can break, and, and that can certainly occur. Um, however, most oaks that we regularly sample, they'll have high outbreak years of gall wasps and, and low years but they seem to just persist. So they might have differences in acorn output, slight differences like that. We haven't measured that yet systematically, but as far as like, do the oak trees just die when they get heavily, heavy outbreaks of gall wasps? No, they, they persist, they keep going. The next year they're fine. Um, you know, many of the live oaks we study are uh, tens if not hundreds of years old. Um, and then do gall wasps differ? So some gall wasps are extremely small, some, wasps are, some gall wasps are extremely large uh, in the galls they form. So they may drag different amounts of energy out of the tree. And then maybe the tissues they attack are also important. So if you attack acorns, right, which are related to reproduction, maybe you're damaging the oak a little more than if you just infect a leaf. So, but we don't really know in great detail, just the structural damage in very extreme levels is what we've seen. So, to pick up on that, so in terms of like causing damage, you mentioned that they're you're, they're using venom, like they're actually injecting venom into the tree. Is that venom only used for inducing galls, or are they also using venom as a defense the way other wasps do? Yeah. Um, so we don't know a lot about this yet. I, I our our lab is collaborating with folks to think about this more, but it seems that that most wasps lay their eggs in something um, and and the the venom they release is not used defensively like the ones we're most familiar with it's you know like a big uh, you know red wasp or a, a, a honeybee that stings you because you get too close to its hive um, it seems that this venom is associated with uh, immune response of the host so some insect some wasps attack um, other insects and they release a little venom and that reduces the immune response of the insect host to attack that new egg same thing with the oaks. It seems like some of the release of this venom is just to reduce the immune response of the plant to attack this uh, critter. So the plants have a very strong immune response for some of the galls. So the ones that gall the leaves, the plant has a defensive mechanism where it just tries to kill all the cells in contact with that egg. So you'll look at a leaf that's been galled and you'll see all of these scars and sometimes open holes in the middle of the leaf. And that's where the plant fought back against the gall former to kill it. Awesome. And so Rose, Rosemary needs to head out in a second. And so Rosemary, if you, do you have time for one group que or question for the two of you, or do you need to head out? Totally okay if you need to head out. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, one group question will be just fine. And then I, I need to jet. I have an appointment with some squid at a, at a pier. <laughs> uh, I wish I had an appointment with some squid at a pier. Uh, I've got an appointment with some Indian food at five, which I'm pretty excited Ooh. about. Mm. But, uh, but I trade it for squid. But so, so here's, here's my question I have for, for you two naturalists. So I played outside a lot, but I wasn't paying attention until recently, I'd say. Were you two naturalists from the beginning? And if so, what have you noticed changing about the world around you over time, if anything? Or like, was there a point where sort of the naturalists, like, I want to know exactly what these are, where that switch flipped? And let's have Rosemary go first, because she's got to go meet up with the squid. By changing, do you mean like climate change stuff or other? Well, well I, you know, I feel like I, I grew up in the woods in New Jersey and now I live in Virginia. And I do feel like, like I, you know, when I walk around in Virginia, there's still grass everywhere. And there used to be, I remember there being ferns. And I don't know if that's the difference between New Jersey and Virginia, or if that's this invasive species that came through. And it made me wish I had been paying closer attention sooner. But I, I feel like when I walk through the woods, they don't look like they did when I was a kid. And I don't know if that's because yeah. I live farther south or it's or invasive species. I bet you're seeing stilt grass, um, Japanese stilt grass. We do have a yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 
I, for sure, I think for me, it's a combination of the more I learn, the more I notice. So there's definitely things I didn't notice as a kid. Um, and also the more you look, the more you see things changing too. So yeah, absolutely. I think writing a book about pigeons made me sort of change my perspective more because I think it's really true that wherever people go, they carry their ecosystems with them. So I think that we need to sort of see the whole thing as part of a whole complicated you know, system of humans and how we interact with other humans and other places and other parts of the land. And so like, it's all kind of connected into, you know, big, broader forces, I guess. So the, the older I get, the more connections I see too. But yeah, I worry about Asia, that Japanese stilt grass, because I did some work for the Park Service in DC and it completely changes the character of everything. So yeah, it's, it's definitely- There's no beating it. Yeah, I, I mean, like technically there are ways to beat it, but it would be so much work. Like everywhere there's a slight opening and the sun can get through the trees, there's still grass. And mm -hmm. I think the seeds bank for years or something like that. And I just, I don't, I don't see yeah. us beating it. There's so much of it here. Yeah, chickens eat it, I've heard. <laughs> we, we have thought about releasing our chickens. We have 18 chickens, but I, I worry that they're gonna get picked off by other stuff in the woods. And so mm -hmm. I would need to make some decisions about yeah anyway uh That's thanks rosemary question. and everybody should get your pigeon book <laughs> yeah yeah i'm so sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna depart to appear but this has been an absolute so nice to joy. meet you rosemary so thank you so much yeah, so thank you rosemary this was fantastic i can't wait for your book to arrive <laughs> i pre-ordered it and i'm anxiously awaiting have fun with Thanks the squid. So Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. We'll have ten copies. Yeah. Bye. Bye. And what uh, about Kelly, you, Scott? I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah, I mean, I was certainly um, an, an outdoors person when I was a kid. Um, you know, most memorable things for me were, you know, just outdoor to adventure was what I was all about. So I, I grew up north of Houston in a very small-ish town that was not really a suburb yet of Houston. It was pretty much just a smaller place at that time. Um, so really just a couple blocks away from where my childhood home was, was a vast forest that went into the bend of the San Jacinto River that led to Lake Houston, which supplies the drinking water for all of Houston. So I had access to an amazing amount of land that as an adult, I realized was probably private land, but as a kid, uh, so I had butcher paper all over my childhood wall where I mapped out every little deer trail, bike trail, blah, blah, blah. Um, kind of in a, kind of a Jacques Cousteau kind of weird way. I was into pop culture kind of science stuff, you know, like love Jane Goodall and Jacques Cousteau. Um, but, you know, it's not like I was studying insects at that point. Um, I certainly was interested in larger animals, uh, snakes, amphibians uh, were some of my favorites. And then I also was a, a, you know, I fished with my dad as a kid. And so, you know, I have the concentration of a pea. So I would fish for about five minutes and then I would just start walking around and looking at things and kind of exploring, kicking over logs that were full of ants and you know, so that kind of stuff, uh, sometimes destructive uh, curiosity as a, as a young person, uh, but uh, eventually that matured, really, it probably finally matured at the point of college, you know, at university where I was able to take courses in natural history. I took a wonderful entomology course. I took a wonderful field ornithology course. At the exact same time, I took an ecology and evolution course. And I was able to combine those conceptual things with the amazing and really hidden biodiversity to me up until that point. I didn't realize how many insects and birds I was passing, uh, even right here in Texas where I you know, didn't know it was so diverse at, at the time. So, so yeah, I wasn't some amazing scientist as a kid, nor am I now, but um, uh, I, was, I was interested in being outside and paying attention a little bit, I guess. Awesome. This was so fun. I, you know, I, I've, I've heard you, you speak on this topic before a few times, Scott, but every time I hear you talk about it, I learn something new. And I also like keep, like, I have a long list now of like, like 10 more questions that we didn't even have time to get to. So I'm going to have to pick your brain 
later. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Love, love to do it. I have to make a quick connection here. I, I would have loved uh, for, for Rosemary to see this, but you know, you mentioned uh, Doug Fatuma in your talking about what this meaning is of, of the term scientific naturalist. And so I just happened to have my, my uh, Doug Fatuma evolution textbook here. So Doug Fatuma literally wrote the book on evolution and on the cover of that evolution book ah. are Rosemary's fancy pigeons. Yep. So there you go. Yes, it all cool. comes together. Vision, yeah. <laughs> and the co-author of that, Mark Kirkpatrick, was my undergraduate evolution professor at UT Austin. And on my dissertation committee for my <laughs> PhD. <laughs> awesome. Great guy. Yeah. Cool yeah. World. It is. It is. Well, this was so much fun. Awesome. Thank you, Scott, for, for dorking out with us. And um, Thank you. And thanks to Rosemary as well. And thanks to all the, the participants who were able to join us and send your questions. And we hope you can, um, you can come back again. Tell your friends about this if you think it's something they would enjoy coming and participating in. If anybody is interested in presenting, please let us know. Um, the Google form for uh, participating is the same Google form as signing up to be a presenter. And um, Kelly, who do we have uh, coming up next? Space is next. So for now on, we're gonna to try to be alternating between, so we, most of the people who propose talks are biologists, but we're, we've got enough that we're gonna start alternating between like biology kind of, and then not biology. And next week is not biology. Uh, well, actually, I guess it's sort of biology and space. Uh, and so November 13th is Aaron Redberg and he's doing planetary protection stuff. Uh, so like when you go to Mars, how do you make sure that you don't deposit bacteria in case Mars has life and you don't want to mess up Martian life? And then if Mars does have life, how do you make sure that you don't accidentally bring that life back to Mars when you come back? Um, so planetary protection. And then Oscar Ojeda is going to be talking about uh, human space flight analogs and simulations. And he's a super cool guy. He's done, he recently did a high seas sim and a Mars desert research station sim. So he's sort of like actually done some of these sims and he'll sort of talk about the value of these sims for understanding what life will be like in space and for planning for, for missions. These uh, are so simulated simulated places right like like going to a place where it's as if you were in a colony on mars but you're somewhere here on earth right right so high seas is in hawaii and it's supposed to be sort of like mars and so you're in a hab that they say well this is sort of like what a hab on mars might be like and so you you have to live here for you know x amount of days and try to run these sorts of experiments and you got to wear space suits the whole time uh and one of the things that i'll talk to oscar about is something that he and i like chat about on the phone sometimes which is how good are these simulations for being on mars and what do they tell you and and anyway so he and i sort of debate that topic uh from time to time and he's he's a fun person to chat about that stuff with so i think i think it'll be a ton of fun uh next week no november 13th Two weeks from now. Yep, every two weeks. So that's going to be fantastic. I am really looking forward to that too. Um, Kelly and I both share a, a, a fascination and an interest in in space and space exploration and science. So uh, looking forward to that. So I hope everybody can come back then. And uh, yeah, we yeah. will see you. We'll see you next time. Thanks for dorking out with us. Thanks for dorking out with us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Scott. Bye, Bye, Scott. Bye, Kelly. Bye.